Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 508. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Lanslone. I believe I have more stories on today's show than I've ever had on an episode of Conflicts of Interest before, so we have just so much news to get through. So I want to jump right into the content, but I have to take one minute to mention that we are holding our fundraiser at the Libertarian Institute. We only do it twice a year. Right now we have matching funds, so your donation will be doubled. We have great kit bags at the Institute, and I promise every dollar that you donate basically goes to helping us to create more content. You know, we use the money uh, to write articles, to put out podcasts, to publish new books. Um, You know, we don't have a whole lot of overhead, no buildings, nothing like that. It's just the crew at the Institute. And if you go to the Libertarian Institute page any day of the week, um, I think you'll see that we put out just as much or more content than almost any other uh, libertarian or, you know, anti-war kind of organization out there. So, you know, if you support the message that we put forward on this show, uh, I'm sure you'll love the Institute. Go check it out. And if you can make a donation and uh, help us to keep doing what we're doing. And with that, uh, and, you know, look, if you can't donate, you can always just help the show by sharing, uh, you know, all the places it's at and follow me on Twitter at Kyle Anslone underscore. And with that, we will get into the news today. First up here, Senator Ron Wyden's threatens to block a vote on the uh, proposed nominated head of the National Security Agency and U.S. Cyber Command. So the senator plans to prevent the confirmation of Lieutenant General Timothy Hu to head of NSA and Cyber Command until the NSA releases more information on its purchases of location data of America. Wyden said... The American people have a right to know whether the NSA is conducting warrantless domestic surveillance of Americans in a manner that circumvents the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. I ask the American people simply be provided with yes or no answers as to whether the NSA is buying their location data and browsing records. Unfortunately, intelligence officials have been unwilling to release even that basic information. And so I think this is actually really important. And Getting this information probably isn't going to stop the mass surveillance program, unfortunately. What it will do is wake up some Americans to the fact that it's going on, and then we could start putting some pressure on our elected officials uh, to, to try to rein this in to some extent. I, you know, I don't think this is going to end it, uh, but understanding the, the significance of they're buying a lot of our data. Right. That I think Americans think, oh, you know, my Google data gets sold to advertisers and things like that. And hell, maybe there's even a few people that think, ah, that's not a bad thing because then I get advertisements for things that I want. But the government is also buying it and it allows them to know essentially anything about you they want uh, without ever having a warrant or any reason to really investigate you. And so, you know, this this is very dangerous and it could be used to enforce a very totalitarian state in the U.S. And so uh, this effort by Wyden is important. All right, next up here, some stories on the situation in Ukraine. This one's important. U.S. denies it's pressuring Ukraine to negotiate with Russia. A U.S. official has denied that the Biden administration is nudging Ukraine towards negotiations with Russia, saying it's up to Kiev when to seek peace. The comments come from James O'Brien, the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasian Affairs, came in response to the report from the German tabloid Bild. The report said that the U.S. and Germany were trying to nudge Ukraine towards the negotiating table by providing just enough weapons to maintain its current battle lines. The Bild story, I think thought was intriguing, but no, there is no U.S. policy, O'Brien said. We've always said that this is a matter for Ukraine to decide. We decide nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, and I think the other reality here is I've seen no indication that Russia is willing to entertain substantive real peace negotiations. Now, I do want to say I'm not 100% sure he's wrong about that last point, and it You know, it may be that if Russia feels they have the upper hand in Ukraine and that they're going to have the upper hand for the foreseeable future and that the Russian military losses, uh, you know, Putin and the Russian leadership judge that those would be acceptable for the gains that they would make in Ukraine. 
it's very possible that Russia is looking at the battlefield right now and says, sure, if Zelensky comes to Moscow on his hands and knees and begs, you know, just to accept a deal where, you know, you know Kiev essentially gives Moscow everything they want, then sure, they would take it, but they're not going to you know, feel they have to really engage in that many compromises at this point, given uh, the military situation in Ukraine. So, you know, I think that could be very true. Now, according to Ukrainsta Pravda, Germany also denied the report. Uh, the German government said Ukraine has to define military and political goals in its defensive fight against Russian aggression. Only Ukraine can set the date of the start of peace talks. The U.S. and most of its NATO allies have discouraged peace talks throughout the war and actively worked against short-lived negotiations in the early day of the conflict. A member of the Ukrainian parliament who led Ukrainian negotiations in Istanbul during peace talks with Russia in March of 2022 confirmed last week that Russia only wanted a commitment of Ukrainian neutrality to end the war at the time. He also confirmed earlier reporting from Ukrainian Pravda that then British Prime Minister Boris Johnson told President Zelensky that even if Kiev was ready to sign a deal with Moscow, Ukraine's Western backers were not. When we returned from Istanbul, Boris Johnson came to Kiev and said that we would not sign anything with them at all and let's just fight, he said. So that, that's a statement from the negotiator. All right, next up here, Stoltenberg says NATO alliance should be ready for bad news about Ukraine. So that's NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said Saturday that the alliance must be prepared for bad news about Ukraine and urge support for the continuing proxy war against Russia. Worst developing phases, Stoltenberg told the German broad, uh, German broadcaster ARD, we have support you we have supported Ukraine in both goods and bad times. We should also be prepared for bad news. Stoltenberg acknowledged that Ukraine has been unable to move the front line, but also claimed that Ukrainian forces were still achieving big big victories. He previously argued that Ukraine was having some success because it was inflicting heavy losses on Russia, although Kiev is currently facing a serious manpower shortage. Stoltenberg comments come after Ukrainian President Zelensky acknowledged to the Associated Press that the counteroffensive was a failure. He said, we wanted faster results. From that perspective, unfortunately, we have not achieved the desired results, and this is a fact. Despite the lack of success, Zelensky said that he's not backing down and that the conflict is entering a second phase. There is not enough power to achieve the desired results faster, but this does that mean that we should give up, that we have to surrender, he said. Russia is also digging in for a long war. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered its military to increase its numbers of troops by roughly 170,000, and that's going to bring the strength of the Russian armed forces to 1.3 million and the total number of Russian military personnel to 2.2 million. Ukraine is also looking to bolster its depleted forces, including by expanding the draft. You, the Ukrainian military wants Zelensky to sign off on a plan to put the lower age age of involuntary conscription for men without military experience to 25. It's currently 27. So dropping it those two years uh, would achieve the, uh, or could add to up to about 140,000 recruits. And just, I was a little confused. So how it works is currently in Ukraine. If you have had past military experience, then, and you're over the age of 18, which probably means you had to be 20, 21, 22, or something like that, then you can be drafted. However, if you don't have previous military experience, then you can't get drafted until the age of 27. That's now going to be dropped to the age of 25 if, if Zelensky signs this, which it, it seems like uh, he, he will. All right, so next up here, Secretary of State Antony Blinken says we must and we will continue to support Ukraine. He said some are questioning whether the United States and other NATO allies in truth co continue to stand with Ukraine and enter the second winter of the uh, President Putin's brutality. But the answer here today is that NATO is clear and unwavering. We must and we will continue to support Ukraine. 
In recent days, there have been a few reports suggesting that Washington is beginning to push Kiev towards negotiations with Russia to end the war. Blinken's Ukrainian counterpart also said that Kiev was firmly committed to winning the war rather than negotiations. Uh, this is Dmitry Kuleba, the Ukrainian foreign minister. He said, we have to continue. We have to continue fighting. Ukraine is not going to bat down our strategic goal, which is the territorial integrity within internationally recognized borders of 1991 remains unchanged. The issue here is not Ukraine. Ukraine security is the security and safety of the entire Euro Atlantic space. Um, he went on to say, hopefully the U S Congress will also find a solution that will be in the best interest of the American people, which is actually to support both Israel and Ukraine. Uh, just on that, that note, uh, we should have a vote sometime this week on that $105 billion bill in the Senate. Uh, that's at least Chuck Schumer's plan. And also there was a statement from, I think her name is Sandra Young. She's a deputy with the budget, the budget office. And she said that, uh, the, the U S would run out of money to arm Ukraine by the end of the year. So that they're giving Congress essentially four weeks here to, to pass that bill. All right, next up here, an article that I wrote for the Institute. It, this one is uh, on November 29th. Secretary of State Blinken, uh, we must and we will continue to support Ukraine. Now, I already mentioned that. The part of this that I wanted to get into is another statement by Kuleba. And he said that Ukraine had become a de facto NATO military. And so... Kuleba said that Kiev was uh, going to continue to win the war. Again, Ari mentioned that. And he added that they had become a, a de facto NATO army at this point. He explained, we are increasing our interoperability with NATO. We are pretty much becoming a de facto NATO army in terms of our technical capability, management approaches, and our principles of running an army. And so after NATO officials met with Kuleba, the alliance issued a statement reaffirming support for Ukraine. It said alliance members will remain steadfast in their commitment to step up political and practical support for Ukraine and will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. All right, next up here from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. Internal polling suggests Zelensky could lose elections to General Volushny. So internal polling within Ukraine shows that Ukrainian President Zelensky could lose a presidential election if he faces off against General Volushny, the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, the Economist reported. So far, Volushny has not expressed an interest in entertaining the entering the political fray, but he has been rumored to be a political candidate. It's also reported that he's been at odds with Zelensky a spat that spilled into the public after Volushny called the war against Russia a stalemate and said there would likely be no deep and beautiful breakthrough. Uh, it's also interesting that on the conscription, lowering the conscription age, it's apparently Zelensky resisting the military wanting to, to lower that age. That's held that up so far. Zelensky, who is still claiming that Ukraine can win the war, later took a swipe at Volushny, saying that the Ukrainian general should stay out of politics. He said if a military man decided to do politics, it is his right, then he should enter politics, and he can't deal with the war. But the polling shows that the Ukrainian public trusts Volushny more than they trust the country's current political leadership, as Kiev has been rocked by corruption scandals. The Economist report reads, the figures which date from mid-November show that Trust in the president has fallen to a net 32%, less than half of what is still uh, for what General Volushny has, which is at 70%. And then the Ukrainian spy chief also has a better rating than the president at 45%. It doesn't appear Zelensky is looking to hold elections anytime soon. So, uh, you know, this all seems hypothetical at this point, but it's important to mention, especially since Zelensky's term is expected to be up next year. All right, one more story here on the situation with Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine claims SBU blew up railways in eastern Russia. The Ukrainian uh, official speaking to media outlets on Friday claimed that a CIA 
CIA BAT, Security Service of Ukraine, the SBU, blew up trains on a railway deep inside eastern Russia. An anonymous Ukrainian official told Politico that several explosions were set off in a Russian region 25 100 miles from Ukrainian territory. Russian media and local officials said reported fires and explosions on train in the region but did not say the cause. The Ukrainian official has claimed that the sabotage disrupted military supplies being shipped through China, although Beijing has denied that it's army Moscow. Uh, the official said this is the only serious railway connection between Russia, the Russian Federation and China, and currently this route, which Russia uses, including for its military supplies, is paralyzed. However, Russia's state railroad company said in a statement on the reported fire in the region that it did not disrupt service. The movement of trains was not interrupted. It was Organized along a bypass session with sight increased in travel time and with a slight increase in travel time. So who knows uh, exactly what happened here. It's possible that this was just a something that happened in eastern Russia and that the Ukrainians are kind of looking for propaganda and victory. And so every time, you know, the there's any kind of railway incident like we have in the U S all the time, the Ukrainians are going to claim that they're behind it. Um, the Russians seem to be saying that, you know, it was probably just an accident and we've already fixed the the situation. I believe this was somewhere, uh, in Siberia, by the way. So next up here, a couple stories on, uh, the U S increasing tensions with China, Washington will expand, expand AUKUS accord to include AI, electronic warfare, and quantum technology. Uh, This was a statement from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, and he said that developing and experimenting with advanced warfighting capabilities such as AI, electronic warfare, and quantum technology would bolster their Indo-Pacific presence. The 2021 AUKUS PAC called for the U.S. and U.K. to help Australia to develop nuclear-powered submarines. Beijing views the agreement as revealing the West's Cold War mentality towards China. All right, next up here. China says U.S. warship illegally entered Chinese waters. Uh, Beijing said the American ship sailed near uh, the second Thomas Shoal in that is, uh, you know, in the South China Sea. I actually have a picture here of the shoal and the beached ship that the Philippines uses to uh, maintain their claim to that shoal. So uh, the American warship was in the region and a Chinese spokesperson said the U.S. seriously undermined regional peace and stability. And uh, just two weeks ago, the USS Mason, a destroyer, was carrying out similar operations uh, that, you know, really provoked the Chinese and really made them irate. So we're seeing this a couple times in recent weeks is concerning. Next up here is Brazil plans to join OPEC plus next year. Brazil recently uh, received an invitation to join the block of oil producing states. Uh, Mine and energy minister of Brazil said his country was eager to join OPEC plus, but needed to complete a legal review of the Blotch Charter. Um, it's unclear if Brazil will become a full member of OPEP Plus or just an observer. Israel, uh, Brazil, at 3.2 billion barrels of oil per day, is the ninth largest producer in the world and the largest in South America, as the U.S. has really uh, wrecked the, the Venezuelan oil production. Um, one quick story here, the, uh, you, uh, South Korean F 35, um, was hit, hit a bird and South Korea is going to retire the 400, $140 million aircraft rather than making repairs to it. All right. Next up here, North Korea says space program is a sovereign right and vows to defend its satellite. The North Korean Defense Ministry said the nation would go to war if its satellite was attacked. Pyongyang placed a surveillance satellite into orbit last month, declaring that having a space program was a sovereign right. The North Korean government refuses to negotiate over the existence of its space program. 
A statement from the Defense Ministry released on Saturday asserted any attack on space assets of the DPRK, which is the the formal name they use for their country, uh, will be deemed a declaration of war against it. North Korean state media, KCNA, reported, adding the U.S. Space Force is deplorable hostility towards the DPRK's reconnaissance satellite can never be overlooked as it is a just challenge to just a challenge to the sovereignty of the DPRK and more exactly a declaration of war against it. Um, the statement goes on article eight of the treaty on the principal government, uh, Governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. So this is the part of international law that North Korea is citing in their statement here. And they say that stipulates that any object launched into outer space definitively falls under the jurisdiction of the launcher state and the ownership of it can never change no matter It remains in outer space or return to Earth. This means that the reconnaissance satellite is a part of the territory of the DPRK where its sovereignty is exercised. After Pyongyang successfully launched the satellite, Seoul retaliated by announcing that it would resume surveillance flights over the demilitarized zone in violation of a 2018 demilitarization pact between North and South Korea. Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un responded by completely withdrawing from the agreement. Pyongyang has since started to rebuild outposts along the DMZ that were destroyed during a recent period of warming relations between the two countries. Washington responded to Pyongyang's success by blasting North Korea at the UN Security Council. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, that's Linda Thomas-Greenfield, called the state uh, the satellite launch a reckless and unlawful action that threatened North Korea's neighbors. Kim Yo Jung, the sister of Supreme Leader Kim, issued a shark rebuke to Thomas Greenfield. She said, I deplore the fact that the UNSC, at which the purpose and principle of the UN Charter have to be secure, strictly respected, is being turned into a land of lawlessness where the sovereignty of independent states is wantonly violated. Extreme double standards are imprudently applied and injustice and high-handed practices are rampant due to the U.S. and some forces following it and strongly uh, denouncing and rejecting it, she said. Continuing the whole course of open meeting of the UNSC over the DPRK's reconnaissance satellite launch convened at the gangster light demand of the U.S. and its followers clearly proves how weak, false, and absurd are the unreasonable arguments of some U.N. member states denying DPRK's sovereign rights. She protested. And so, uh, you know, I think this is kind of important to understand how the North Koreans kind of see their country, right? They're saying that we should be treated on equal footing as other countries. All of you have these military surveillance satellites that you could look at North Korea with. And so we should have the same things. And if you're going to be hypocritical about that, we're, we're going to call you out for it. During her speech to the United Nations, Thomas Greenfield also said the U.S. was open to talks with Pyongyang. She said, I I took heed to the trivial explanation. Oh, and then uh, Kim Yo Jong responded to Thomas Greenfield by saying, I took heed to the trivial explanation of Thomas Greenfield, who is described to the U.S. as a victim of the present situation, while illustrating their standing for meaningful dialogue and efforts for peaceful solution out of a lack of justifiable grounds for branding the uh, DPRK's right to space development as illegal. So she's saying that you know, Thomas Greenfield says they want meaningful dialogue, but look at all this hypocrisy. And then she continues, the sovereignty of an independent state can never be an agenda item for negotiations. And therefore the DPRK will never sit face to face with the U S for that purpose. And so I think this was widely misreported in the West as saying that North Korea was refusing talks with the U S 
but what happened was, is Thomas Greenfield said that North Korea didn't have the sovereign right to have a space satellite. And so North Korea was reacting to that. And they're saying that they're not going to sit and have talks with the U.S. for anything that is within their sovereign right. And so the U.S. has nuclear weapons and North Korea has nuclear weapons. They're not going to sit and talk with the U.S. Uh, about that. But they do want, I'm sure, would be willing to talk with the U.S. about overall uh, trying to de-escalate tensions on the Korean Peninsula. They're just not going to sacrifice any of their state's sovereignty for it. All right, news about Israel here. and We have a lot. All right, first up, Washington is profoundly concerned about Turkish ties to Hamas. Brian Nelson, the Treasury Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial, Financial Intelligence, said, We are profoundly concerned about Hamas's ability to continue to fundraise or find financial support for its operations for potential future terror attacks here in Turkey. Nelson said that the... Below and funds from Turkey to Hamas stopped on October 7th. However, the country has played a, quote, prominent role in past fundraising streams and that Hamas is going to see to take advantage of this fact as it raises additional funds. And Nelson made the remarks while in Istanbul. Of course, always notable that Turkey is a NATO state. Uh, and in the North Atlantic Alliance with the U.S. And there's also some tensions there over Turkey not uh, lifting their block on Sweden joining the alliance. Next up here from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com. Report details how Israel intentionally targets civilians in Gaza. A report from Plus 972 Magazine published on Thursday details how Israel is intentionally targeting civilians in Gaza as a part of its war strategy, even when Israeli forces no strikes will kill young children. The report, which cited current and former Israeli intelligence officials, said the massive civilian casualties in Gaza since October 7th are due to Israel expanding its authorities to bomb non-military targets and the loosening of restrictions related to civilian deaths. Israel's operations in Gaza have had a high, very high civilian casualty rate, but never at the scale of the current conflict. Sources told Plus 972 that the Israeli military has files on many potential targets that give them a good idea of the likely civilian casualties that their strikes will cause. In one, in one case discussed by sources, the Israeli military command approved the killing of hundreds of Palestinian children in an attempt to kill one Hamas commander. The source said, nothing happens by accident. When a three-year-old girl is killed in a home in Gaza, it's because someone in the army declared it wasn't a big deal f for her to be killed. And that was a price worth paying in order to hit another target. We are not Hamas. These are not random rockets. Everything is intentional. We know exactly how much collateral damage there will be in every home. The report also explained that Israel's targeting power targets, power targets is in a quote, which includes civilian infrastructure such as high-rise apartment buildings, Baines universities, and other public buildings. Three sources who have been involved in hitting power targets told 972 that the purpose is that a deliberate attack on Palestinian society will exert civil pressure on Hamas. Israel used to often warn people to evacuate targets before they were hit, but that practice has also been less common. In the current war, apartment buildings full of civilians have been leveled with absolutely no warning. And so, you know, think about that real quick. What they're talking about, they're striking the power targets. Uh, you know, these are institutions needed to keep society functioning. And so it really seems like what they're saying is that they're, um, you know, trying to destroy the, the society in Gaza. Sources told 972 Magazine that the files uh, the target files for high-rise apartment buildings and other civilian infrastructure always contain some sort of a alleged association with Hamas, but the real purpose is to harm civilians. Um, 
the source understood some explicitly and some implicitly that damage to civilian is the real purpose of these attacks, the magazine reported. Another category of targets that Israel strikes are known as family homes, where Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives live. In many cases, Israel has destroyed private residences to kill one Hamas member. The report notes that in the current war, Palestinian testimonies assert that some families that were killed did not include any operatives from these organizations. And so they're saying that at times it's it's clearly wrong. They're destroying single family homes and uh, the, there's no Hamas member that lives there. The report said that most senior member senior Hamas operatives are in tunnels deep underground in Gaza. Many of the attacks on family homes target alleged junior Hamas operatives. The Israeli military is able to carry out such attacks at an incredibly fast sp space thanks to an artificial intelligence program known as Hasbara, uh, but it's also called the Gospel. So detailing what the AI program does, Actually, you know what? I'm just going to hop to the next article I have because I wrote a, a little bit more of a detailed article on the gospel here. So Israeli AI assassination factory plays central role in Gaza war. The uh, Tel Aviv has been relying on AI program dubbed the gospel to select targets in Gaza at a rapid pace. In past operations, the IDF ran out of targets to strike in the besieged enclave. A statement from the IDF website says the Israeli military is using the gospel to produce targets at a fast pace. Through the rapid and automatic extraction of intelligence, the gospel produces targeting recommendations for its researchers with the goal of complete a complete match between the recommendation of the machines and the identification carried out by a person. So the former head of the IDF said the system was first used in the May 2021 bombing campaign at Gaza. He said, to put it into perspective, in the past we would produce 50 targets in Gaza per year. Now this is machine produces 100 targets in a single day, with 50 of them being attacked. And so that is a, a quite substantial, uh, you know, increase in, you know, they're, they're producing twice as many targets in a day that were being previously produced in a year. The IDF does not disclose what it inputs into the gospel for the program to produce a list of targets. Thursday, the Israeli outlet plus 972 magazine reported that Tel Aviv was using AI to pit targets in Gaza. A former Israeli official told the magazine that the gospel is being used as a mass assassination factory. That's his quote. The program is selecting homes of suspected low level Hamas members for destruction. A source told the outlet that strikes on homes kill numerous civilians. One source was critical of the gospel and said, I remember thinking that it was like if Palestinian militants would buy bomb all the private residences of our families when Israeli soldiers go back to sleep at homes on the weekend. On Friday, the Guardian expanded on the reporting from 972 by reporting that the gospel plays a central role in the Gaza military operations. A former senior Israeli military source told the Guardian that the Operatives use a very accurate calculation of the number of rate of civilians fleeing a building before and implementing a strike. However, other experts have experts have disputed that assertion. A lawyer who advises the government on AI and compliance with humanitarian law told the outlet The Guardian that there was little empirical evidence to support this claim. These are just some numbers I put together, which would really suggest that uh, the, this program is basically just kind of a fig leaf, right? Like they need something to say that they're to give them targets to hit. But if it comes from a human, then you're basically just, you know, picking civilian homes to blow up. But if you have this technical program that gives you this list and you call it the gospel it sounds like it's very advanced and it's going to be able to pick up on little behaviors and little things to make sure that that you're able to pick out Hamas where they are you, you know it's kind of this idea of having a smart bomb right that this is 
it gives a lot of people the impression that the bomb just guides itself right to the terrorists when, uh, of course, what it just goes and hits whatever target more accurately than a dumb bomb would. But if you're picking targets with civilians inside, you're, you're still going to ki kill civilians. And so this doesn't change that. And so if you look at the numbers, it's pretty clear. So during the two month long conflict, Israel has hit over 15,000 targets. According to the Euromed Human Rights Monitor, Israel has dropped more than 25,000 tons of explosives on the Gaza Strip. The IDF reports that it has only killed between 1 and 2,000 suspected Hamas members. Uh, but there are there's another official who puts that number up to 500, uh, 5,000, excuse me. But even then, at the same time, at least 15,000 civilians have been killed, including 6,000 children. And I believe 75 percent of the dead or are, are women or children. So Richard Moyles, a researcher who heads Article 36, which is a group that works to curb uh, civilian deaths during war, said the images of Gaza prove that Israel's bombing of Gaza has not focused on accuracy. Look at the physical landscape of Gaza. We're seeing the widespread flattening of an urban area with heavy explosive weapons. To claim there is precision and narrowness of force being exerted is not borne out by the facts. This week, the BBC reviewed drone and satellite images of Gaza and determined that over 100,000 buildings had sustained damage. That not, I think it's 98,000 was the total they had at the time, although I'm sure with the bombing campaign over the past couple of days, it's now over 100,000. Israeli sources speaking with uh, 972 Magazine also dispute the claim about the IDF attempting to avoid civilian casualties. A senior intelligence officer told... Uh, said, told his officers after October 7th that the goal was kill as many Hamas operatives as possible, for which the criteria around harming Palestinian civilians would be significantly relaxed. A second source said that the massive bombing campaign was due to the embarrassment that the Israeli government suffered on October 7th. All of this is happening contrary to the protocols used by the IDF in the past, that there is a feeling that senior officials in the army are aware of the failure on October 7th and are busy with the question of how to provide the Israeli public with an image of victory that will salvage their reputation. And so, you know, Gaza is being flattened so the Israeli military could salvage their, their reputation there. Now, uh, real quick, uh, you know, one of the reasons they probably need to salvage their reputation so much is because of this absolutely bombshell report by the New York Times. Uh, I pulled a couple quotes from it and just put them on uh, Twitter here. So, New York Times, Israel knew about Hamas attack a year before October 7th. According to the New York Times, Israeli officials obtained Hamas's battle plan for the October 7th terrorist attack more than a year before it happened, documents, emails, and interviews show. But the Israeli military and intelligence officials dismissed the plan as aspirational, considering it too difficult for Hamas to carry out. The documents circulated widely among Israeli military and intelligence leaders, but experts determined that an attack of that scale and ambition was beyond Hamas's capabilities. In July, just three months before the attack, a veteran analyst with Unit 8200, Israel Signals Intelligence Agency, warned that Hamas had conducted an intense day-long training exercises that appeared similar to what was outlined in the blueprint, but a colonel in the Gaza division brushed off her concerns. Hamas followed the blueprint with shocking precision. The document called for a barrage of rockets at the outset of the attack, drones to knock out security cameras and automated machine guns along the border, and gunmen to pour into Israel en masse uh, in paragliders, on motorcycles, and on foot, all of which happened on October 7th. Underpinning all of these failures was a single... Uh, fatally inaccurate belief that Hamas lacked the capability to attack and would not dare do so. That belief was so ingrained in the Israeli government, officials say that they disregarded the growing evidence to the contrary. Officials privately conceded that and had the military taken these warnings seriously and redirected significant reinforcements to the south where Hamas attacked, Israel could have blunted the attacks or possibly even prevented them. Uh, so 
that's just what a, what an omission uh, about this war. You know, not even to get into everything we talked about on the show last week, which is Israel's past support for Hamas and propping Hamas up in Gaza and using Hamas to basically give Tel Aviv an excuse to never have to negotiate with the Palestinians. All right, next up here, an article that I wrote for antiwar.com on December 1st, Israel planning for Gaza war to last over a year. The Financial Times reported speaking with sources who said that Israel plans to wage war in Gaza for over a year in a little less than two months. Israel has killed at least 15,000 people, damaged 100,000 buildings, and displaced 1.7 million Palestinians, and destroyed most of Gaza's medical facilities. On Friday, Financial Times reported sources said Israel was preparing for a multi-phase conflict in Gaza that will last at least a year. This will be a very long war. We're currently not nearly halfway through to achieving our objectives, said one person familiar with Israelis' war plans. According to sources, Israel's goals include killing three top Hamas leaders while securing a decisive military victory against the group's 24 battalions and underground tunnel network and destroying its government capability in Gaza. Israel does not appear close to achieving its goals. U.S. sources have said that the Israeli military operations in Gaza have failed to impact high or even mid-level Hamas members. On Saturday, The Guardian reported that Israeli officials said that one to 2,000 Hamas members have been killed. However, Financial Times spoke with an Israeli military source that gave an estimate of 500 dead Hamas. It is unclear why there is such a large discrepancy in the numbers, as both were given during a week-long pause in fighting. In either case, the Israeli military operations had killed more children, at least 6,000, than members of Hamas. The mass civilian toll has led to a mounting world opinion against Israeli military operations. Secretary of State Antony Blinken attended a meeting of the Israeli war cabinet on Thursday and warned Tel Aviv will lose more international support as the conflict continues. Uh, a general, the head of the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, the Israeli Defense Force Chief of Staff, said military operations in Gaza will take more than a few additional weeks, suggesting Tel Aviv did not plan to follow Washington's advice. Still, America's top diplomat said Washington was firmly committed to arming Tel Aviv. The first phase of the war, an intense bombing campaign and ground evasion, is expected to last well into 2024. One source said the first phase of the war was probably about 40% complete. Gaza City isn't fully finished yet, nor is it conquered. It's about 40% done, the person explained. For the North as a whole, it will re probably require another two weeks to a month. The second phase will be an operation with fewer military operations aimed at stabilizing Gaza. While a source told Financial Times that the second phase is projected to continue until late 2024, Israeli officials say they cannot predict a final endpoint to the conflict. And so this means that the, the military operation will last, our occupation at least, you know, Israeli forces, you know, actively controlling and what they're going to call securing Gaza will last until 2024 through 2024. Uh, the Biden administration has pushed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to agree to allow the Palestinian Authority to control Gaza after Hamas is defeated. However, one source told the Financial Times that Tel Aviv will not listen to Washington, even as the U.S. provides Israel with billions of dollars in weapons. Uh, the source said, no one, not even the U.S., can talk to them about this. Uh, that person emphasized that the point was crucial to Netanyahu keeping his far-right war cabinet together. All right, next up, another story I wrote for antiwar.com. U.S. sent Israel 15,000 bombs since October 7th. The Wall Street Journal published details about the White House's secret arms transfers to Israel since October 7th. The U.S. has provided Israel with 57,000 artillery shells and 15,000 bombs, including over 5,000 2,000-pound warheads. According to a list of weapons attained by the journal, the U.S. has shipped Israel more than 5,000 
MK-82 unguided or dumb bombs, more than 5,400 MK-84 2,000-pound warhead bombs, around 1,000 GBU-39 small diameter bombs, and approximately 3,000 JDAMs. Those are um, the, the kits to upgrade dumb bombs into smart bombs. The U S has additionally shipped 57,155 millimeter shells to Israel. NBC news previously reported in October that Washington sent Tel Aviv artillery rounds that are cluster munitions. So, you know, the 155 millimeter rounds are important for a couple of reasons. One, this is one of the weapon systems that, uh, Tel Aviv and Kiev are really competing over. Uh, they both really want them. So it's interesting that uh, Israel has gotten so many in two months. I guess this will only really sustain the Ukrainian army for a few days. Uh, but still, with shortages being what they are, you would almost assume that really the threat to Israel at this point from Hamas isn't that high. And you would think that with, you know, tank shells and other weapons that Israel has, that the U S would just kind of tell them that like, Hey, we need these particular weapons over here for now. We're not giving them J dams and our, I guess we're giving them some J dams, but we're not giving them these larger, uh, American made bombs. And, and, and you know, they don't have F six scenes at this point anyway. So we could give you a lot of bombs. We just can't give you 105 millimeter shells, but that that's not what's going on. U Ukraine, has expressed that they feel like they're in competition for Israel for these weapons. If the U.S. sent Israel the cluster version of 155 millimeter shells, that's really atrocious. You know, to, to use those weapons of all places in Gaza, one of the most densely packed regions on Earth, would be absolutely disgusting. So a former deputy assistant secretary for defense and officer in the Marine Corps described the weapons that the U.S. Uh, would send as weapons the U.S. would only use in non-urban areas. They are the kinds of weapons for choice for fights we had in Afghanistan and Syria in open non-urban areas, he said. The U.S. may use them in more urban areas, but would we'll first do a lot of target analysis to make sure the attack was proportional and based on military necessity. By contrast, Gaza is about 140 square miles and home to 2.3 million people. Additionally, Israel has relied on an AI program to rapidly generate lists of suspected low-level Hamas members to target without respect to civilians in proximity. The Israeli military policy has led to widespread destruction in Gaza. At least 15,000 civilians have been killed. The number of dead Palestinian children exceeds the number of dead Hamas fighters. And nearly 100,000 buildings in Gaza have been damaged by the Israeli bombing campaign, including the destruction of universities, hospitals, schools, and entire residential neighborhoods. On Saturday, the New York Times reported that Israel was killing civilians in Gaza at a historic pace. The outlet added that the that part of the explanation for the huge death toll was Tel Aviv's willingness to drop 2,000-pound American bombs on various civilian centers. A former Pentagon analyst who advises the Dutch organization POTS told the Times that he's never seen anything like it. It's beyond anything that I've seen in my career. Adding that to find a historical comparison for so many large bombs being used in such a small area, one would have to go back to Vietnam or the Second World War. Israeli officials and American politicians have attempted to justify Tel Aviv's slaughter of Palestinians in Gaza by referring to the Allied bombing uh, campaigns in Tokyo during World War II. In a single night during the bombing in Tokyo, more than 100,000 people were burned to death by American napalm bombs. The White House has made some requests to Tel Aviv to try to curb civilian casualties. However, Biden administration has refused to condition fewer Western shipments to Israel on reducing the civilian death toll. The U.S. has primarily relied on aircraft for a quick shipment to Israel um, in the hundreds of millions of dollars in arms in the past two months. Unlike weapon shipments to Ukraine, the Biden administration has refused to provide the public with information on the arms it provides to Tel Aviv. So we don't get those nice lists every time we send them an arms package. We're selling uh, Israel arms every day. And this is the first real detailed report that we've got of it. And I, I'm guessing that it only is a limited report that there's a lot more information that, that we could learn about that. 
All right, next up here, Doctors Without Borders says Israel responsible for attack on medical convoy that killed two. An investigation by Doctors Without Borders into a November 18th attack on a medical convoy that killed two people in Gaza concluded that all elements point to the responsibility of the Israeli army for this attack. So this is, you know, just one specific of the many war crimes in Gaza, but I thought it was worth it to maybe zoom in on just one and, and talk about it a little bit. So a statement from the organization said by the organization's logo on November 20, which can be attributed to an intervention of an Israeli bulldozer and heavy military vehicle. These vehicles were potential evidence in the case of an independent investigation on the attack of MSF, which is the French name Medical Sans Frontiers of Doctors Without Borders convoy. Shops were aimed at the MSF facilities where colleagues were sheltering leaving bullet holes in interior walls. On November 24th, MSF staff also witnessed the destruction of a minibus, also clearly identified by the organization's logo, by an Israeli tank. That minibus had been sent by the MSF team in South Gaza following the destruction of the vehicle in the north a few days before to facilitate the evacuation of colleagues from the north. Medical Sans Frontiers condemns, again in the strongest terms, the attack on its convoy and extends again condolences to the families of victims. Uh, Medical Sans Frontiers requested a formal explanation from this attack from Israeli authorities and calls for an independent investigation to establish the facts and the responsibilities. The staff and mem family members who went through this ordeal had been trapped in uh, MSF facilities amid heavy fighting with no electricity and limited access to food and water for almost two weeks. A Doctors Without Borders staff member described the attack. When we arrived on the street, which is close to our office and guest house and clinic, I saw taints and snipers at the top of the building. I was terrified when I saw that the snipers and the taints were pointing their weapons at us, especially at the fourth and fifth van in the convoy. They start opening fire at us, and when the bullet and when a bullet grazed my forehead, I got a superficial injury. The bullet hit my colleague in the head. He sat next to me. He got a critical head injury and started bleeding massively. His head fell on the steering wheel, and I immediately retook control of the steering to move to the right of the street. And so that was the initial kind of Israeli attack on the convoy that leaves at least one person dead. Two days later, after the convoy, a bulldozer clearing the way for an Israeli tank came through and damaged our cars and threw them away from the right and left side of the street. And I witnessed from the window upstairs in the Gaza clinic, when the bulldozer pushed aside the cars, the Western wall of the clinic fell apart and the tank came in and opened fire towards the MSF cars and vans and the MSF fan caught fire. I was in the clinic. The fire and the smoke came inside. We stood there thinking about how to stop the fire. We moved the children and the women through the bad doors to the other building where the MSF had a uh, physiotherapy department. The staff member said that during the ceasefire, Israel destroyed vehicles attending to evacuate them to the south and I, you know, this is just the, the, the Israeli military behavior. First, they open fire on a medical convoy, and then they do everything they can to, you know, destroy the evidence and further damage the clinic. All right. So this is a story from NBC News and uh, abandoned babies found decomposing in Gaza hospital weeks after it was evacuated. I initially saw the video uh, of this you know, these alleged decomposing baby bodies uh, still on their hospital beds last week. And it's just one of those stories where you, where you want to be sure before you talk about it. And so NBC News, I think, did a pretty good job here. They say they attained an uncensored version of the, v, uh, the, the video and they showed it to experts who confirmed that the 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 general statement that these are babies who were, you know, dead for two weeks and were decomposing. 
And so it, it generally made sense. And then you have statements from the doctors and uh, other nurses and people who are in the facility who said that they were basically forced to evacuate and that these children were premature or had other health conditions, you know, not children, babies, babies. And so they, you know, you can't just walk a baby through a war zone if it has a condition where it needs constant oxygen or something like that. And they weren't able to take oxygen tanks and, and things like that with them. And so uh, it appears that essentially what happened is Israel forced the doctors to evacuate and then just didn't care about the babies left behind. And, you know, it's likely that the medical staff limited the the notify the Israelis of the babies. All right. So next up here, limited number of aid trucks reach Gaza after Israel resumes bombing about 50 aid trucks enter Gaza on Saturday. Aid shipments to the besieged enclave were halted on Friday after Israel resumed military operations. The aid is a small portion of what the people in Gaza require before the Israeli military operations that have displaced 1.7 million people. Gaza required about 500 trucks of aid a day. The number of trucks entering Gaza has in, has in, was increased to about 200 per day during a week long truce. Uh, during the first, you know, six, seven weeks of the Israeli bombing campaign in Gaza, there was just a few trucks getting into Gaza every day. The UN reports humanitarian operations within Gaza have been largely halted and said for services within shelters and limited distributions of flour in areas. Uh, south of uh, the the midpoint of Gaza, so just absolutely horrible what the the people of Gaza have to live through. All right, next up here, I had this story: Israeli forces are operating throughout Gaza, uh, which you you know is just a statement from the IDF. I also just really wanted to, if for anybody listening to the. I usually don't do this where I have like a little part of the show that's just for the people watching. But for those of you watching, check out this map that Israel put out. It's got, I don't know, thousands of numbers on Then The numbers go up to 2000. And so I guess like 2000 different zones, right? And Palestinians are supposed to look at this map and take the evacuation information given to them by the Israelis and find the correct zone. Uh, just, you know, looking at the map, you see what a joke this is and how uh, this really is an Israeli ethnic cleansing campaign of Gaza. All right. So Israel has withdrawn its negotiators from hostage release talks. Uh, this is kind of unsurprising. But, you know, while the, the U.S. is blaming everything on of, you know, the, the renewed fighting on Hamas for not releasing more hostages. It's really Israel's choice to go back to war here. All right. Next up, Dave DeCamp, antiwar.com, December 3rd. Israel expands ground operations in Gaza, says war in the south will be as big as the north. The Israeli military said Sunday that its ground operations have expanded to every part of the Gaza Strip and vowed its assault on the south will be just as big as it was on the north. The head of the IDF or the IDF chief of staff said it will be no less powerful than the operations in North Gaza. It will have no less results. We have the capabilities to do it in the most thorough way. And just as we did with strength and thorough, thoroughly in the north of the Gaza Strip, we are doing it now in the south of the Gaza Strip. And we are continuing to deepen the achievements in the north of the Gaza Strip, he said. His comments came a few days after Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Israel and told Israeli officials to account for civilians in the south of Gaza before expanding military operations there. But Israel has continued to ignore U.S. warnings, which rang hollow as the U.S. is shipping Israel 2,000 palm bombs to Israel while saying no red lines for their use. And so to you know claim that there's any real um, pressure that the U.S. is putting on Israel when in reality, we're just, you know, shipping them more and more bombs to continue to do what they're doing, uh, you know, means it's not working. All right, everyone. 
I think that's where I'm going to wrap up the show for today. I had a couple more stories, but I could certainly talk about them on the show next week. I did want to mention on on the show last week, I mentioned uh, the, a situation with Venezuela where the U.S. Uh, could either extend or put more sanction or put the sanctions back on Venezuela. Now, it was supposed to expire Thursday. I did not see anything about that. But I think maybe the reason why is there's now reports that Venezuela is eyeing, uh, seizing some territory held by a, a neighboring state. And so I, I guess the Venezuelan people vote on it and they vote to go to war. <laughs> so that's democracy in action. Uh, be atrocious if, it, if Venezuela did it. Of course, you know, you shouldn't invade, you shouldn't start wars. But one look more into about before I, before I talk about more, and I'm honestly not sure what the White House is going to uh, reaction is going to be here. And as we saw from today's show, just got so much stuff to talk about right now that uh, a potential war in South America just, uh, you know, I'll have to I'll have to find some time to do some reading on later in the week, I guess. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with more later in the week. And if you're still watching, it means you probably love this show. And so head on over to the Libertarian Institute and make a donation. Your donation will be doubled and we have some great kit bats.